morning, everyone. Simone Jordan here from Awabaka Limited, and we're here today with the amazing Kai Simon, national and international soccer star, who we're really proud to have as an Awabaka Health Ambassador. Um, I would like to just begin by introducing Kaya, who's a Matilda, and we're really excited about some of the things she's going to share with us today. And I guess just uh, ask you, Kaya, to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm currently here in my off season. Um, you know, I'm based over in the UK in, in London. Um, so yeah, I guess a little bit of my backstory is I grew up in Western Sydney in a little suburb called Quakers Hill. Um, I have two brothers and a sister. Um, and yeah, basically started playing football or soccer when I was eight years old. I played league before that because um, we had a league mad family. Um, so I played sixes, sevens and eights um, for Blacktown City Rugby League Club. Then I went across to uh, soccer or football and basically fell in love with it. Um, I guess from that point, um, I kind of yeah said to mum and dad, I guess when I had some advice or a bit of an opinion that I was okay at the sport, um, I thought, you know, this is something that I really enjoy. So... I want to pursue it and and see where it takes me and mum and dad and my siblings were in full support of me following my dreams and yeah I guess fast forwarding down the track I'm 30 now and I played over 100 games for the Matildas, been to uh, two World Cups, um, two Olympic Games and um, yeah played all across the world and I guess football's given me that opportunity to do that and um Yeah, I guess I'm just super grateful for having my family there who helped me kind of, yeah, get to where I am today and continue to support me on my journey. Over 100 games, that's very impressive. And the Aboriginal community is very proud to see someone reach that standard of in any sport. Um, Coming from a football background family, I know the difficulty, how how difficult that would have been (laughs) as well to convince people that soccer was worthwhile taking that pathway, (laughs) but it's obviously done you really well. So um, growing up in Western Sydney, how is that for you and and who's your mob and is that where you come from originally or that's just where you grew up? Yeah, so I grew up in Western Sydney but my mom's, uh, mob's from, um, well dad's originally from Taree, mum's from Armadale, so you know, Anawan, Anawan and Birupai, um mob. So um, yeah, I guess I've been yeah grateful enough to be able to go back and see Mob in in Armadale a couple of times and try to stay in contact you know from afar as much as I can with with my Mob and you know close family in Sydney. But yeah, grew up in Western Sydney, so you know that's that was pretty much where I spent most of my childhood um, until you know I packed my bags and I moved overseas at the age of twenty, where I went to America to you know pursue my dreams and, and play football over there, but. Um, yeah, I mean, growing up uh, in Quakers Hill, like I said, it was a rugby league family. Um, you know, we supported the NRL, um, went to so many games. Dad played footy. My brother, elder brother played footy as well. And um, I think along with rugby league, we were at almost a different sport every weekend. Um, you know, our parents enrolled us into every sport you could name I think it was every sport except for netball it wasn't really my type of game but it was my sister's game but um yeah I think um I would say humble upbringing um but mum and dad I think um I guess made a lot of sacrifices and tried to give us the best upbringing um that we possibly could and you know I guess things were financially tough but they did all they could to send us to a private school Pacific Hills Christian School and Um, They actually met at a church when they were younger. So I think, you know, religion kind of helped them, uh, guided them um, in a certain way. So, yeah, I think that's why we ended up kind of at a Christian school is that kind of gave them that that kind of guidance um, throughout our upbringing. And, um, yeah, I guess super grateful for that because the school was really supportive through throughout our schooling and and also with my sporting endeavours. And recognising that you had that talent as well. And I guess... I'll just touch on that a little bit because I have read some things in the last few days where you've um, mentioned the support of your family and how important that was to you. And we underestimate, you know, the sacrifices that our parents make sometimes. I've done it. We've all done it. And it is costly to to have kids enrolled and playing in registered sports. So to see 
uh, someone like you and have you as an ambassador in our community. And you obviously have very strong ties to the Wabakul community through your family, which you have mentioned. But I think for the kids of today or the young people of today who are really trying to aspire to meet their their goals and their dreams, you are a real inspiration to that, that it can happen. And we all go through different events in our life that, that mould us to who we are. And I know that you talked about um, in one of your in- interviews previously that you learned about some trauma in your family that wasn't sort of told to you until you're old enough to understand it. And it gave you a greater respect for that. Um, is there anything you can say like to our young people who are, who are going through this stuff in life and and I guess just, just encourage them to keep going, you know? Like, is there anything that you want to share around that sort of stuff that might help someone navigate that? Yeah, look, I think um, obviously, like I mentioned, my parents went through a really tough upbringing. They... Um, you know, really struggled to kind of make ends meet, you know, separately in their own childhoods and upbringings. Mum's, um, you know, one of 13 kids. So you could kind of imagine with a single mum, you could imagine how like hard that was um, for her to kind of, yeah, I guess navigate her way through school. And um, then obviously mum and dad met and uh, at a fairly young age and um, then had us kids and, um, yeah, I think across the board from all my cousins to I, we all had, um, you know, our parents had a similar upbringing and it wasn't, um, you know, the greatest in terms of there was no privilege there and, and kind of what they went through was, was fairly tough. And um, I think at some point, no matter how tough the road is, there's got to be someone that breaks that barrier. And I think my parents kind of broke that circuit in terms of, made some positive choices and decisions to ensure that us kids had a better upbringing than they what did. they did. Mm. And I think that was, I guess, the turning point in kind of the circuit or the circuit breaker was the decisions that they made. And yeah, I guess I wouldn't be where I am today if they didn't make those decisions back then. And um, yeah, I think it takes that. I think it takes kind of like, yeah, a lot of sacrifice, but, you know, I guess positive um, choices that you make it might be someone influential in your life who has a positive impact on you and you want to spend more time with them or they share maybe a little bit of advice or um, you know kind of guidance in your life that maybe you need if you're seeking for a bit of kind of help or, or guidance in your life there's always um, you know people that that want to help it's just a matter of finding the right people that help you and support you and you know obviously it helps when you have close family and friends that support you within your dreams or can help you through um, tough times. There's definitely been a lot of people who have helped me. It's not just been my immediate family, but it's been coaches or teachers at school or um, other students at school. Um, You know, I guess people that resonate with you and you can kind of feel the vibe with them that, um, you know, they have your best interest at heart and will support you or help you or pick you up when you're down because you know I I am a professional athlete but it's not always been smooth sailing it's always not sunshine and rainbows you know there's definitely been some lows and some highs but um yeah I think the thing that stayed true is that I've always had kind of belief in myself and I think a lot of that comes from within to really have that um positive outlook of, of I guess look at the silver lining no matter how hard things are and I know it's easier said than done but when you're in the thick in the midst of those dark times um, you really need to have that willingness within yourself to want to pull yourself out of that or to get yourself through that um, with the support of other people around you Um, because I know when I've been in those dark times it does feel like a very lonely place but there is people whether you know it or not there is people that do want to help you um, whether you don't know them or know of it in that moment, um, if you ask for help and it's okay to, you know, admit that you're not okay and mm. to ask for help. And I think throughout my career, I think I definitely have, and throughout my life, I've definitely realised that it's okay to show people that you're not okay, but also to ask for help. And you'd definitely. be surprised at how many people actually do want to help you, mm. even though everyone has their own stuff going on in their own lives. Um, you know, there is a lot of people that, you know, just from the kindness and genuine genuineness of their own heart would help you through tough times. I, I feel that your mum and dad have shown amazing resilience mm. in that journey. Yeah. 
and um, that you've inherited some of that mm. <clears throat> and you've just explained in a really wonderful way like mm. to our, our young kids not to be frightened to ask for help and it, it is okay not to be okay yeah. and we all go through that and our Indigenous communities and our Indigenous families have various issues that we do need to break those circuits on and um, and I guess you're a really great example of that and kudos to mum and dad and congratulations on on, on having that resilience and recognising that you do have that opportunity to seek support from other people because I think we don't do that enough no. and I think our young people and our high rates of suicide etc demonstrate that mm. um, so you guys young ones especially that are out there listening to this need to remember that there always is someone even if they're not looking like there's someone there and mm. Kai has just reiterated that and and I will also reiterate that just in my experience as an Indigenous person, that there are things that we are we need to be resilient about, whether it's our day to day stuff, our career, our family, and we just need to remember that we are a mob and that we're not alone. Yeah, I definitely think also. Um, I think I learnt this like as I got a little bit older and a bit more mature as as well as when you show that you're not okay or that you know yeah may, maybe having a bad day or whatever there's almost this stigma around it that it looks like you're weak mm. and you don't want to show emotion and I think sometimes you're stronger to ask for help yeah, yeah exactly and I think it takes more yeah strength to actually ask for help and and show people that you're not okay it's okay to also show emotion and I think I learnt that kind of probably only in the last you know five or so years really and I'm 30 now so it took me until I was 25 and um, I think the earlier you realize that the earlier you can be vulnerable mm. also open up to people because I think the moment you actually open up to people they get to know you more as a person then they can understand you more and then they can actually help you more um and yeah like I said it's easier said than done but as soon as you do that then you create better bonds with people better relationships with people like you get more from your relationships whether it's your siblings your parents your closest friends your teachers whatever it is but you just get on a level of understanding of each other and then I think you become closer with people then you create more trust you know within those relationships with each other so yeah if there's definitely one piece of advice it's you know it's okay to not be okay it's also okay to just ask for help I agree totally yeah back to soccer Mm -hmm. so male dominated sport yeah and you're a female in a male dominated sport which I know over the past probably 10 15 years has changed a lot Mm -hmm. and I have grandkids who play sport so watch football and soccer and know that they have mixed teams to a certain age but what were the challenges for you I suppose as a female in that in that particular area yeah well where do we start Um, (laughs) (laughs) no so um, yeah I think I think the pureness of being a female athlete is that when I came into the sport as an eight-year-old girl You know, it's really pure in terms of why you begin playing a sport. It's because you love it. It's because you enjoy it. Um, You know, money's not a thing at that age in terms of, you know, what you're earning. You're not earning money. You're playing for the love of the game. Well, even as a professional woman player, we know that that there's a gap in that. Yeah, well, yeah, there still is. Your love is evident. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) definitely. So, and I think throughout my career, I came into the sport, you know, I'm really grateful for the time I came into the sport because I've seen it when it's been you know not full-time professional Mm. and then obviously it's changed since I've been kind of in the professional realm for the last you know 14 15 years but basically when I first came in as a 16 year old um first debuted for the Matildas I think um we were kind of at the point where I mean these are little things but you know our laundry wasn't being done all the time on tour so we'd be washing our underwear in the sink in the bathroom and we're away representing you know the our country. country yeah um so little things like that I mean there's been numerous times where we've been wearing a male kit it hasn't been a female female cut you know playing yeah. strip yeah and even in terms of just trying to perform and play and feel comfortable within your own skin how do you do that if you're not wearing kind of a cut that actually fits you mm. well I know it seems so small no but, I can understand you know that. just little yeah. things um kind of throughout um you know not to mention the pay parity and the gap mm. in terms of um when I you know I guess when did I start actually being full-time professional I would say it wasn't until maybe five years ago where I actually could just 
be a footballer. Before that, I was having to work another job. Job um, work, find sponsors. Yeah. yeah. And, and that I, takes a lot of time too. It does, yeah. yeah. And you always think like if you're kind of dividing your attention, focus, commitment between two different things, then you're never really going to be able to do one of those things to, the, to your 100% potential because you have to split your interests. Um, and the funny thing is when I first debuted for the Matildas, I was actually working at Rebel Sport just as a sales assistant on the floor. So I was working, you know, a nine... Lucky to, Rebel Sport. Yeah. <laughs> I was working like a nine to... It was four because I had to race off for training, but a nine to four retail job um, still in high school. And um, I think my year 12 year, I was at school maybe... 50% or less because I was away traveling with the Matildas mm. um you know which I loved you know being able to travel the world at such a young age but yeah the fact of the matter was like I played pretty much or I have played you know eight nine years of my professional career whereas I was still holding down another job outside of being a professional athlete um and it's only been yeah you know, I'd say the last five or so years where I've actually been a full-time professional and the thing is being a f- an athlete it's kind of a 24 7 job because you have to worry about or not worry about but focus on what you're eating what you're putting Mm. into your body Mm. making sure you get enough sleep um you know not going out and and partying and drinking and and smoking and making kind of healthy choices but it's really there's not really much time where I can sit at home and just switch off other than when I finish training and I'm just laying on the couch watching Netflix because Mm. I just want to relax and Mm. Um, let my body relax and and that's kind of my downtime really but at the same time um, you never really switch off because you're always thinking about is this going to make me perform to the best of my ability on the weekend what do I need to do for training tomorrow it's kind of a constant thing so and I'm grateful that I get to do that now and I can say I'm a full-time professional athlete Um, it has been a long time coming for you know female athletes in general and I guess we are kind of in the process of getting to the point where we don't have to have the conversation of there being pay parity and, um, you know, I guess a difference in our male counterparts and us. But, you know, it's not just us who are currently playing. We had so many players before us who paved the way in in football who played for the Matildas before even I did. And they were fighting this battle long, long before I ever pulled on the green and gold um, Guernsey. But, yeah, it's it's definitely come a long way from when I first came into the sport and I mean it's on an upward trajectory at the moment um mm. with the world home world cup next mm. year I think is huge so um yeah there's a lot of exciting things in and around women's sport and and female football and yeah to kind of be a part of that process is yeah a liberating experience but also kind of an empowering feeling um that you can feel like you're making impact for you know future generations to come into the sport and for it to be at a standard where they don't have to worry about those things they can maybe one day buy their parents a house because they earn enough money and um you know I guess what um men are able to do as male athletes yep I get that I get that well I agree that there has been a long journey and advocacy for that but I think you've picked up the baton and run with it pretty well Mm. and um I particularly wanted to just touch on the Black Lives Matter movement and um, the Matilda's flag. Like, that was pretty amazing. And I believe that you had instigated that. Do you want to just share a little bit with people about how that came about? Yeah, so we were in um, Tokyo for the Olympics last year, so um, 2021, um, even though it was called Tokyo 2020 Olympics. But um, so basically before the tournament, um, you know, I guess myself in terms of, Indigenous women within the team. We have Lydia Williams and myself. And um, I think before the tournament, we kind of had a feeling that we wanted to do something to represent our mob and we didn't really know kind of how to go about it. It's it's almost a sensitive subject because we didn't want to put that on any of the non-Indigenous girls in the team Mm. and and kind of force their hand with wanting to support it. So, you know, we'd mentioned it to a couple of people and then I actually had a chat with Sammy Sam Kerr and she's our captain and um, we just said look it'd be great if we um, could do something in terms of you know I guess the Black Lives Matter movement was happening and taking a knee was happening a lot across the world and kind of um, yeah across the board in terms of different sports and it was like 
well, do we want to take the knee? And had this chat with, with Sammy and just said, well, yeah, like it'd be great to be in support of that. And obviously we're all passionate about Black Lives Matter, but at the same time we have our own, um, I guess, things in our own backyard and obviously we've got our own mob here and mm. our own kind of story in terms of, you know, our Indigenous culture and heritage. And it was like, can we do something that's going to represent you know our mob really and represent what Australia is and and what our culture means to us and what better way to do it than on the world stage at an Olympic Games and we threw some ideas around we thought about maybe wearing masks in with the Aboriginal flag on them um, thought about wearing t-shirts but you know there's a lot of red tape around the tournament like there is any tournament with um you know making um, a stance or a political stance on anything um, and so we just came up with the thought. I think also what, what resonated with a lot of us is Kathy Freeman was a lot of our, um, you know, role model and, and childhood heroes growing up. I think she was for most of for us. For most people, yeah, yeah across the world, not just in Australia. Hey, you're so. up there too now, don't worry. <laughs> so um, I think it was a bit of a, yeah, full circle thing because she did that, you know, 20 years, 21 years prior to that. Um, when she draped the Aboriginal flag over her shoulders with the Australian flag and we thought, you know what, why don't we, um, instead of taking an E, let's link arms around the centre circle um, to show our solidarity, um, to show kind of what we stand for, um, to, you know, represent our culture and our heritage. It's the longest standing culture in the world and let's be proud of that. And so had that chat with, with Sammy and then brought the team in together and um, she just said, oh, do you want to just have a brief chat to everyone and kind of share the thoughts that we've spoken about? And I, I just, you know, stood up there and said, look, um, obviously Lids and I are proud of our heritage and our culture. Um, we had the Taking a Knee initiative, um, Black Lives Matter kind of initiative, but we thought we could do something a little bit closer to home if you're all comfortable with that. If anyone doesn't feel comfortable, then we won't do it. We want the whole team to feel you know like they're in support of that not to feel like they just have to say yes um and if you don't feel comfortable to say it in front of the group come up and say it to anyone in the mm. leadership group or it's also okay we're not trying to make anyone do something kind of they don't want to and the team were in full support of that and I think we have a, a really nice feel and kind of team morale and um yeah family culture within the Matildas which is really nice that everyone was like nah that's a that's a great idea let's do that like that certainly says a lot about your team and yeah your captain and and the fact that they were so willing to support that being non-indigenous yeah also also shows me that we are making ground because they were happy to support that and I believe you also uh, have a role on the Football Australia National Indigenous Advisory Group. I do. So that sort of stuff that you're doing, you've started that movement, will continue possibly with what you can do in that role. Yeah. How, how did you get into that? Yeah, so basically I think off the, I mean, off the back of that Olympics campaign and, and the other thing actually when we did um, agree to do that, we said, well, why don't we hold the Aboriginal flag in front of our team photo? So that was... We one loved of, it. Yeah, but that was one of the first, yeah. I think one of the first uh, sports to begin the games and um, we may or may not have got in a little bit of trouble after we did that. But um, again, like I said, there's a lot of red tape around, but, you know, it was all worth it. And I agree. It was such a proud yeah. moment. I even had, you know, mum and family, a lot of them messaged me when I was over there and say everyone loved it. it we did. Because we, like, we didn't actually know either yeah. that, that was going to happen. Yeah. So I remember the feeling within the community in general, Australia in general, every Australian was proud. Yeah. And yeah. and I think we are changing attitudes as we, like you said, we are the livest, old oldest living culture and, mm. and people are actually starting to be educated around that, whereas previously there was different stories that were told in school yeah, um, yeah. And, and education and also us sharing stories and interacting with um, with big organizations and and non-indigenous groups and and being professionals in those areas now is also changing that so I, I think it's amazing that you're on that board and I think that was just the beginning of a very a very big change that you will be able to influence down the track and we're really proud of that as yeah. your community yeah so. thank you no definitely I think with having that I mean it's the first time there's been an indigenous advisory group with football Australia and 
you know, we have general meetings kind of here, there throughout the year. And um, yeah, I guess I'm involved in that. And it's just a real privilege to kind of be involved in it because in terms of any decision making, in terms of culture, um, in terms of, like you said, education, I think that's the key for the sport to move in another space of, you know, recognising our culture and I guess initiating parts within our sport that maybe other sports are doing a little bit better at the moment. I think if we can educate the people that are making the decisions within the federation, that then filters down to the rest of the community. Definitely. And that's also the importance of having, you know, I mean, along with myself, there's so many other great people that are in that um, Indigenous advisory group. And at the end of the day, any decision in terms of culture gets run by our group and before it wouldn't even go past anyone it would just either not be a conversation or it it would be decided decided without kind of you know ticking off things right in terms of Mm. culture and doing them in the right way but you know credit to Football Australia and Sarah Walsh has been at the forefront of that in terms of really pushing that agenda and making sure it's done in the right way and I really feel that's coming from a genuine place as well it's not just like a tick the box and it's done um and yeah, that's been a really, um, yeah, like I said, liberating process for me and a proud moment for me also to still be a current player for the Matildas, but also to be involved in that aspect of, of the business or the sport as well has been really good. So some exciting things, I can't share too much, but some exciting things in the next 12 months in terms of the sport um, and our mob um, to look forward to. We might need to get you back for another chat after that. Yeah. <laughs> We've, we've followed your career and know that culture is very important to you and that's been evident in the way that you've carried yourself in that sport as a representative of the Aboriginal community and your community, our community, the Australian community in general is very proud of that. Okay. Um, and I'll just go into some of the communities that you visit talking mm. about that. So you do soccer clinics and um, training clinics in some of the remote areas. Is that something you love to do or is it difficult to do because you don't have the time to these days? Or Yeah, so how they first started was it was 20... I was going through an injury at the time. I think it was maybe five or so years ago and I just... I wanted to... I think the idea first stemmed because when I was growing up there was rarely a female kind of team or program that was female only and that girls could go and express themselves and I guess train with like-minded other females I was one of two girls in my whole entire region in western Sydney that played football and Mm. I wanted to just create a safe environment for young females who wanted to pursue their dreams or play football Um, and I kind of saw it as more as more of a mentoring um, kind of opportunity rather than come and learn new skills of course girls would come and and learn you know new skills or or work on um, their football there but that's kind of how the idea started and I kind of yeah reached out to a couple of people or a couple of contacts that I had that said look I've got this idea can you help me kind of bring it to fruition and um, yeah I guess from then on I haven't been able to do it as much as I've wanted to obviously I live overseas for majority of the 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 year year. so it's really hard to do that but any opportunity that I get to touch base with community to go out and if it's run a clinic or even if it's just to go and chat to a school or you know a small um, football team or or whatever it is um, you know I really enjoy those those moments I think um, obviously it's part of being a professional athlete and being a role model but I get I think I get more out of doing those things than the kids do. Um, I just find like it's a really, um, yeah, enjoy, like I just really enjoy doing it and I get so much joy from doing it and chatting to the kids. And at the end of the day, I'm just sharing kind of what I've experienced and and what I've done in my football career. But at, at the end of the day, it's just a bit of a chat with them. And hopefully if I can inspire, you know, one or two of them to follow their dreams and you know, that makes the job or the, the visit all the more worthwhile. I know a couple you've inspired. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I say that because um, it's, it's a natural part of them learning from you. Mm. And, and so many of our kids, especially in schools and, and over the past few years with COVID, have faced so much challenge, so many differences in how they've lived their normal life and they're Mm. just getting back to sport now Mm. we've had weeks of rain here locally so like we're playing two games a weekend at the moment to try and catch up um but but I have no doubt that those talks would inspire kids and and 
that you sharing that story will provide opportunities, even if it's not to play their sport, but to, to know that they can take on the challenge that they don't think they can meet. So. Yeah, yeah. And definitely when I do speak to them, it's, um, you know, I'm, obviously I love football and it's football is kind of my life, but I'm also not going there and saying you have to play for the Matildas one day or the Socceroos or, you know, pushing them in terms of that. But I think the beauty about sport is there's so many kind of life, life lessons that you learn throughout it, you know, whether it's resilience, hard work, determination, commitment, whatever it is but I think there's so many things that you can then relate to you know your schoolwork or uni or um, your everyday life work um, whatever it may be and I think um, without even really realizing but I've learned so many of those important life skills through sport and that's then given me the tools to be able to I guess excel in other areas whether it is study and, and work and I think that's what sport can really bring so many of our young kids and and our mob is you know those important tools that they can take into any part of the life and excel in any part that they want to and i was reading um an article where you were talking about your one of your first tours with the matildas and and mum and your brother might have been there i think and they were traveling around watching your games and driving yeah. across <laughs> the equivalent of across this country yeah. to watch you play because they couldn't afford an airfare. So, yeah. you know, for those kids and families out there who don't think this is possible, this is the family that's actually found a way. And uh, it was really, it was really lovely. I, I knew a, a little bit about your career and have followed your career through the soccer and the media. But when I started to look into it, it was really evident some of the challenges that you'd faced um, in life and it was really it, it made me really proud to be actually sit here and talk about that and share that with other people today because you are an example of resilience and you're doing a great job oh, thank you and I'm sure every day there are challenges that you face but is there one in particular that stands out as maybe your biggest challenge in your career um I mean, I've definitely had my fair share of injuries throughout mm. my career, you know, just to name a few. I've had two um, ankle surgeries on both ankles, one ACL knee reconstruction, both my shoulders done, um, and then a few soft tissues throughout the years. But um, I think um, the one that probably would stand out to be the toughest in terms of getting through it was when I had surgery on my left ankle it was 2019 January um and I actually had the surgery um uh in January and it was leading into the World Cup um which was in June July and you know I I guess I was pouring my heart out blood sweat and tears into my rehab and and really trying to do all I possibly could to get back in time for this World Cup um obviously the rehab process is one thing then it's getting fit then it's getting match fit and then Mm. it's being World Cup fit and international level fit I'm scared already yes so you know it's not just okay your injury doesn't hurt anymore you're good Mm. to go like there's a process in terms of getting back to that level so a lot of physio a lot of recovery yeah that actual yeah a lot of gym work field work just a lot of hours that go in did you move back home I I was based in Melbourne so I I did the surgery in Melbourne because I was playing with Melbourne City at the time I did this the rehab down there and mum actually flew down because I I was immobile for a month or so and she flew down to to look after me and um, I'd be in the gym I'd get in there at 8 9 a.m and I'd ring her and ask her to come pick me up at three o'clock and she'd be like what are you doing in there all day and I'm like mum I'm rehabbing this is how long the process is in terms of you know what I have to do I was in there doing gym cardio physio then recovery and it's kind of it is an all-day thing it's a like I said 24 7 um, hour job and basically long story short from then um, until when selection came out um, I then went to America which is where I was signed to finish uh, to start the season off with Houston Dash at the time and the coach called me and said look you're not included in my 23 for the World Cup and that was like a dagger through my heart because I just I you can know, imagine after all that yeah all that of uh, I think it was three four months of rehab every day like a good you know six to eight hours a day just like pouring everything in and I had one goal and that was to be at that World Cup in France in 2019 and I think that was the first time that I'd ever not made a team or you know not been selected um 
And, you know, the reasoning was because I hadn't played a lot of match minutes, you know, I guess in the in the year leading up to that tournament. But at the same time, it was, you know, it was a real gut-wrenching moment for me because I'd fallen short from my goal. And I thought, you know, if I do all I possibly can in that rehab to give myself the best chance to go, that's all I could do, really. I could only control what I can control. Um, so I think that was probably the hardest in terms of the disappointment of mm. done all I possibly could within my control, but then it's still not being good enough. But I think that's also the reality of sport and, and life sometimes is you could, I guess, dedicate as much time, you could put in as much hard work, make all the sacrifices, commitment, but at the end of the day, you know, you might not get what you want at the end of it. And that was probably the hardest, I think, moment because, yeah, like I said, I'd fallen short. I had to watch the girls from afar in terms of, you know, being there at a World Cup. I can't even imagine how that felt. Yeah, so um, the good thing was I actually got to go and I don't know if it was a good or a bad thing, but I got to go and I did some um, broadcast commentary stuff Mm. for the first game. So I actually got to physically kind of see the girls out there playing. But, you know, bit bit bittersweet and, you know, I much would have preferred to be out there with my boots and, you know, in the Matilda strip playing. But um, I think... When you do have a setback like that or a disappointment like that, the important thing is that there's always another opportunity after that. And I think that really spurred me on to then get myself in shape, then the next tournament, you know, kind of blow it out of the water or just give myself the best shot to. And it, I guess, put that fire in my belly to want to do that. And, you know, I love kind of proving people wrong. And if people doubt me, then I love backing myself and just, you know, we well, certainly did it. that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess a disappointment, but then you always have to look at the silver lining in, in any kind of tough situation. And as hard as that was, you know, being away from home and getting that phone call when I was in America on my own and, yeah, you know, stuff like that, it just kind of made it even worse. It's easy when you have kind of people around you, but when you're, on the other side of the world and kind of have to go through. How's that been for you? Because you spend so much time overseas. I know how much, and I I know you're very close with your family and Mm. you've actually shared with me today, you're having a night out with them tonight and that's exciting. But like, how is that for such long periods of time? And how do you get through that? Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, because I've done it, I've been, basically traveling since I was 15 16 years of age in mm. terms of going away from home in you know I guess lots little time yeah, yeah little lots of time whether it's a Matilda's tour young Matilda's tour whatever it may be but the first time I actually officially moved over for a period of time was when I was 20 and that was to Boston in America and a um, little bit daunting I went with one other Aussie girl to make a but at the time and um, so had another Aussie there which was nice a little piece of home where you are which is um, always comforting but yeah I guess it's it's kind of the way of life really um, I think if you got too hung up on you know missing home or missing family too much of course I, I miss them so much yeah. and I love coming back and seeing them but I think that's also a sacrifice that I have to make and they have to make as well um, you know my nan always says to my sister when she speaks to her and says you know Kaya should just quit soccer come home (laughs) get a normal job because she misses me obviously and um yeah I do I do miss them and it never really gets easier you know as much as I do it but I think it's you almost have to have a little bit of a block to that at some times when you are so far away from Mm. home because if you let yourself get too caught up in the emotions of always missing them missing home wanting to be home then you know I probably would have retired and stayed and settled down in Australia and and not continued playing football so yeah it's definitely a sacrifice um and yeah I miss them a lot I think the beauty of of having FaceTime these days is oh yeah you you know you can have a good yarn with with the family that the time difference is a bit of a punish though that's the only thing is when I wake up everyone's going to sleep and vice versa so that's another yeah that's a, <laughs> that's another thing to um to I don't add think, on I don't to think it. your nan would have minded by no, the sounds of it. no no well nan still doesn't have an iPhone so she's got a landline so I have to wait till um till you know my sister or my brothers or mum go over there to actually have a chat with her so it's even longer between times but I've sent her a few postcards or I'll send her some stuff in the mail and it's a bit of a novelty for her to receive, you know, packages in the mail. So she loves that, you know, little bits and pieces from London. So 
Um, You'll have to make sure she watches this. Yeah, so definitely. That, yeah, so Betty Hampton, and... she'll love the, the little <laughs> shout out. So um, no, she she's proud of me still. She watches all my games, comes to yeah. the games when we play here for the Matildas um, as much as she can. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, family have also come overseas and seen me play and you know play at Spurs mum was just over there recently um play at World Cups and and Olympics so I think you know that's also a great opportunity for them to kind of see their hard work at the end of the day and what they sacrifice for so you know I just need to do my part and make an interesting game and perform well for them to make it worthwhile for them to make the trip but um I don't think they'd mind too much they'd just be happy to catch up with you yeah definitely what about your proudest moment or what's been your most memorable, happiest achievement like in your soccer career? Um, so I think I've got um, I've got a few. So um, obviously you can never really forget when you debut and that was for me, I was 16 years of age. Um, we travelled to America, um, who were the number one female football team at the time and... I think as a 16 year old I was just out there and I was just like this is cool this is fun didn't really have many nerves and I was just like you know I'm I'm good enough because I've been selected to be here and I'm just going to go out there and back myself and almost when you're younger you just go out there and you just play freely and you don't put any extra pressure on yourself and I still remember the song that was playing throughout the warm-up the the weather was torrential rain (laughs) so windy sideways wind and yeah it's weird because I can almost remember that moment as if it was yesterday and um kind of relive that feeling and the emotions that got when kind of walked out and I think yeah achieved my lifelong goal of representing our our country and playing for the Matildas and that would definitely have to be up there um I guess being the first Indigenous player to score a goal at a World Cup in 2011 um, when I was 20 years old um, scored two goals against Norway in our third group game Um, I didn't know that I'd done that until I scored the goal and afterwards got the player of the match and they said do you know you're the first Indigenous player to ever score male or female at a World Cup and that's pretty impressive yeah so that was a a pretty proud moment for me obviously Um, had my family in the crowd as well for that they had you know the Aboriginal flag Mm. Up, like they always do mm. um and when I scored the goals I literally in a you know crowd of 30,000 people could pick them out which was a really nice feeling give them a wave yeah, yeah give them a wave yeah. blow them a kiss and then um yeah that game got us through to the to the knockout stages which um we we ended up winning that 2-1 um and then just most recently obviously at the Olympics when we you know as a team it was just such, such proud it was such a proud moment for me to be a part of the Matildas but also proud of you know being aboriginal being proud of our heritage and our culture to um, have the team's full support but to be there and like I said full circle from being inspired as an eight-year-old girl or nine-year-old girl watching Kathy do it at the 2000 Olympics here on home soil to then Mm. you know 21 years later be able to almost do the same thing in terms of hold the flag up in front of our team um, before we play the first game um, for that tournament I think was definitely another one of my proudest moments um and you know we create we've created a lot of history as a team over the years but definitely creating history of I know we finished fourth at the Olympics but you know the first time we've made a semi-final in the history of the team we were real proud of that too yeah <laughs> like don't play that one down yeah. and I know this last Olympics there was actually quite a few Indigenous athletes uh, probably more than we've ever had I know we had boxers mm. we had athletes we had soccer players mm. I think we really start I mean we've always had a presence in sport but we're really starting to be recognized in that selection process which I guess is part of you know what we've talked about today and things changing so yeah yeah I think also at the um uh, at the Olympic Village, so obviously every country has their own building and, mm. and little hub and we had the Australian building and um, I've never seen so much Indigenous artwork throughout the building. Um, Carl van der Kuyp, he's, yeah. he's my mob, but yeah. he's there and he's definitely at the forefront of, uh, and you know, Patrick Johnson's there yeah. as well and they're at the forefront in terms of, yeah, just that cultural awareness and, you know, they had... Um, posters up in the meal rooms and stuff of all the Indigenous athletes names on that and it just felt like really um, I guess cultural in there you felt like there was, was that, welcoming. Yeah, that welcoming feeling of 
being you know it being the Oz building and being in Tokyo you wouldn't mm. even feel like it just had that warm feel mm. to it and and enriched in so much culture and that was a real proud moment because I'd never seen it like that before and um yeah it kind of yeah spurred me on a little bit more even you know the kind of stance that we took or you know what we did with the flag on the on the first game um yeah it just it just made me excited for the tournament and um yeah just being kind of recognizable in terms of um our culture being recognized and you know it not just being a thing kind of in the background but it was Mm. front and center and and everyone embraced it which was a really nice feeling well i compare that moment in my thoughts like we've had a few strong moments where we've really got a message across in indigenous sport we've had nikki winmar we've had goodsy and we had the tokyo flag so (laughs) that for for us as a community and your supporters was a real highlight yeah and i guess like getting towards the end of our chat what what are you thinking kai is going to do after footy like in the next five to ten years what are your plans and then afterwards yeah um it's like the million dollar question i (laughs) feel like I mean, football is my passion and, you know, I've, it's been my life, you know, for, um, since I was an eight year old girl and I would love to be involved in some way, but I also feel like I'd love to do so much beyond that as well. Um, you know, I've got a real interest in business and kind of being my own boss, running my own business. Obviously I've got the clinics and I'd love to, um i guess progress them into something bigger um where i could really touch base with a lot of community and kind of inspire you know a lot more people across and and touch more lives i think um you know even post career and more being more hands-on and being in the country more i think i'll be able to do that but um you know player agency really interests me and that's maybe a way that i could stay involved in football without being a coach or or taking on a role like that but um, yeah, I just feel really open-minded about what post-career looks like for me. Um, I've definitely got, like I said, passions in, in areas like football, business, helping people, helping community. Um, and it's just a matter of, yeah, encapsulating that into a role or several roles and seeing where that can take me. But um, no hard, you know, set in stone plans at the moment, kind of keeping it open-ended um and yeah see see where the penny kind of drops well whatever you decide to do you've shown us that you have the ambition and the stamina and the resilience to do it and i think you're a fantastic role model and i think whatever you decide to do will be amazing and it will contribute to the lives of other people because that's the role that you've taken in your sporting career So I just want to say thank you for coming in and having this chat today. It's been amazing to share your story. You have an amazing story and um, I feel that you can be a real inspiration to our young people in our community. You live a healthy, happy life. We've all had challenges. You've shared those. And um, I just want to say thank you for coming in and having this chat. And is there anything that you would like to share with community before we sign off today? Yeah, well, firstly, you know, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, like I said, I'm always outside of the country. So when I can come back and really touch base with, you know, my roots and, and touch base with community and I guess they can get to know me on, you know, another more personal level than just what they see through the TV or through social media. But, yeah, I think the key thing for me and kind of as what, has kept me kind of at the level that I've been at or kind of got me through life is I've definitely had a lot of low moments and disappointments and setbacks but like I said earlier in the chat I think what's been the one thing that stayed real true to me is one I've been true to myself I've not been afraid to be who I am and believe in what I believe in not just follow the crowd but Um, to just back myself kind of in every moment to find the self-belief within myself and I think everyone has that you know everyone has doubts but they also have can can compound that with self-belief and that determination within themselves Um, to also not be afraid to ask for help I think that's a big thing as well Um, it's not going to be always smooth sailing there's going to be you know dark times but I think when you have you know the bright times you know it's all worthwhile um it's never to a point where there's no turning back and there's you know never an opportunity to find help and seek help in in certain people so don't be afraid to do that um and follow your dreams like don't be afraid to follow your dreams and and fail one and then set another goal and then 
follow that one you might fail 10 times but then when you finally achieve that dream or that goal um, no matter how small or big it is then it's going to be worthwhile Um, so yeah if there's one thing I can say and to kind of sign off on is don't limit yourself with low expectations but believe in yourself and see where that gets you well there you have it folks a wobba pod with kaya simon our beautiful kaya simon and thank you so much for being so personal and sharing your story with us today of course thank you and we look you. forward to working with you as our wobby cool ambassador and sharing those health messages with the community in general thanks kaya thank you appreciate it <laughs>